I'm Margaret Cho, and my last meal would be truffle fries, smoked salmon pasta with a vanilla Coke Zero, a sag paneer burrito, dulcet bibimbap with a root beer float, and shortbread cookies. Everybody has exactly two things in common. We all gotta eat and we all gotta die. Margaret Cho, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, so is your last meal something that you've thought about before? I haven't thought about it before, but then I am fascinated whenever anybody's autopsied mm -hmm. and they go through their stomach contents. And I'm like, hmm, okay. So you had that, all right. And then, you know, if it, whether it's fully digested, whether it's partially digested, if there's like water in there, if they drowned. So when, <laughs> when do you die? Like during your autopsy, do you want people to carve you open and be like, wow, she was a person of class? I guess um, I think it's curious just to see like, oh, how diverse mm -hmm. yeah. this, this person ate, ate so many different things and really truly an omnivore. So I would like to have that distinction. Although I think I do also have a touch of pika, which is eating non-food items. Oh. Like I really have a problem. I want to eat my um, ear pots. Have you ever eat, tried? No, but I, I, I have seen like things online where cats or dogs swallow them mm -hmm. and then you can hear the music play through. But I, whenever, <laughs> when I first got them, I really wanted to swallow them like, or bite them like a Tic Tac. If you want to make that part of your last meal, we can, do we have AirPods? Can if I could just like move it, it could even be a Raycon, you know, you could just, <laughs> not, not sponsored. Well, how often do you think about death? I guess I don't think about it much, although I have been thinking about it more recently because I just turned 54, so I'm closer to that than being born, I think. Although my family tend to really live a long time. Either they're die, they die real fast, mm -hmm. or they just stick around forever. I would have either died in my 40s or in my hundreds. Interesting, how did they die in their 40s, if you don't mind me asking? Just different kinds of uh, war. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's um, that's most. You know, of it, different right? kinds. You know, different kinds of artillery. Yeah. <laughs> bombs. A mortar here and a land bomb there. Landmines. Landmines. A couple of suicides. There's a lot. A trigger warning. Um, there's a couple of like sort of, like it's mostly like kind of war and really stress, mm. fire. You know, stress yeah, yeah. related <laughs> yeah. things. But then also there's also like high alcoholism. Uh, like okay, a high, okay. like dr really drinking yourself to death. You got to be really drinking if yeah. you die of alcohol. It, 45, but that, that's that's also there too. So you already beat the odds. You're already in like the upper echelon. I'm in the upper echelon. I really follow the ones that lived a long time that are still alive, mm -hmm. that be living, keep on living, don't stop living. Do they want to live? Because I have a grandma who's about to turn 101 and all her friends died. And when I asked her the secret to a long life, she said, just don't have any pleasures, happiness, or hobbies. But she seems to be pretty mad about it. Do you mm -hmm. want to live to that long? I want to live to that long because I want to write the definitive Hollywood would tell all oh. because there's so many things that I can't talk about because everybody's still alive. That sucks. So I'm waiting. I want to be the last one standing, <laughs> and that's what the title will be: last one standing. But I'll probably be sitting or on a walker. So you want to outlive all your friends so you can trash them to make yeah. money, but right before you die. So fun. That's the American dream. Yes. <laughs> you ready to eat? I'm so ready. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, Margaret, for the first course, we have vanilla Coke Zero, we have a smoked salmon pasta, we have spaghetti that has been cooked and then added to a cream vodka reduction with the smoked salmon in there, a little bit of Meyer lemon zest, and then garnished with some fennel frond and fresh cracked black pepper. And then we have truffle fries, they are shoestring fries that have been blanched and then garnished with truffle oil. And then we have fresh black truffle for shaving on the top. That What a luxury to have the fresh truffle. Thank you. Uh, this is actually brought by an Italian man named Giuseppe who just rides up on a motorcycle. This is true and pulls a box of truffles out of a trench coat. Mm -hmm. And then we try and pay him and he goes, you pay me later. And then he kind of disappears. And I don't know if we've ever paid Giuseppe. It's incredible. What a, what a plug. I to honestly. Have. That's, a, that's the truffle plug. This is gorgeous. You can tell me when to stop, but I'm gonna you can, keep going. You can, uh, you can stop. This to me is like the perfect meal that you would have with your newly divorced dad that you're not living with. Mm. And so he's gonna take you to a restaurant that's hopefully on top of a department store. This is like a divorced dad's idea of fancy. You know, there's some, there's like, he's going into some effort here. Yeah. Like he stopped drinking. 
He wants to get back with the mom, and this is how he's yeah, going to. The shirt's still a little, a little wrinkled because he's still, you know, he never really ironed before. He he's shaky, know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but he means well, and this is actually the way that he would present that. That is beautiful. So pl please dig in. I'm please. excited about this part with the, all of the um, the stuff. It, I mean, it reeks of truffle in here, and I'm incredibly excited. Well, I want to stick a little truffle on here. On the pasta? Mm -hmm. We have a whole truffle. If you want me to grate truffle over everything, I can truffle up that Diet Coke for you. <laughs> that would be good. It's wonderful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Gosh. This oh. is great. The shoestring comes, looks, tastes like it comes out of a can, which is a mm -hmm. high compliment. Thank you so much for divorced dads, especially. They're trying to make it work. They're trying to make it work. Do you think you emotional. give off divorced dad energy? I have such divorced dad energy. I have like real, like, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get her back, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to get her back. Okay, let's try, I'm gonna try this, the, 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 this is a special Coke. We had to go to, I believe, a Jack in the Box that has a Coca-Cola freestyle machine, the ones that were designed by Ferrari, where you can add the syrups to the Coke Zero, because mm -hmm. I believe they discontinued this. It was a great soda when it was out. It's really good. Mm. What a treat. Yeah, please dig into the pasta. Don't, oh, yes. don't let me stop you. This is incredible. My divorced dad took me to the Sizzler to apologize because they had a 99 cent kids buffet. Mm, I love the Sizzler too. This is so good. Mm. I mm. love the Sizzler because it has like abominations of um, royal Russian cuisine. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I think the Sizzler is very good. I, I completely agree. I gotta ask, did it feel better to be nominated for an Emmy or to be named as one of the world's most beautiful women by a mass murderer in his manifesto. Oh, you know what? It's really hard. It's a hard one. I, right? That's really hard. <laughs> Don't make me choose. Come on, Christopher <laughs> Dorner or like, you I know, mean, the establishment. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was a good, because I was like, oh my God, that's so, don't kill me. But I, I think again, like a last meal, mm -hmm. this was sort of the last, uh, sort of missive that's going out into the world. So, you know, it's it's interesting. I think that, you know, unfortunately, the problem with gun violence and mass shooter, you know, these kind. he was sort of like prototypical, not prototypical, but one of the first that we sort of remember mm -hmm. kind of recently that did have the manifesto. Actually, yeah. he's probably the first one in sort of modern, non modernish era after the 2000s of gun violence, like after mm -hmm. Columbine, yeah. that I remember having an actual fully fledged manifesto. Let's just keep the, I'm the most beautiful woman part. <laughs> we love that, doesn't matter that, who said that's it. That's fine, I'll take that. that. But you could leave the <laughs> 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 I, I, I only skimmed it. I saw, I was like, oh, Margaret Cho, hell yeah. Like, and then hey. the rest was, you know. Like the bold face, yep. <laughs> the bold face names. Most manifestos aren't that coherent if you really like shocker. But yeah, horrible. Yeah, terrible. But I mean, congrats. But I'm yeah, you're so pretty. That's, it, that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you've been doing stand-up comedy for damn near 40 years at this point. Yeah, it's crazy. And I feel like there's a recent trend, maybe it's not that recent, of mostly dudes who are complaining that audiences are more sensitive, that comedians are getting canceled or censored. I'm curious about your take on that as an openly Asian queer comedian. I'm so openly Asian, like you can't, <laughs> you cannot deny. Wait, sorry, does it say, oh. No, no, you can't, you can't. Asianly open queer. I'm not in the closet about being Asian. Clearly, I'm not in the Asian, I'm not in the China closet. <laughs> um, you can't. No, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's great though because we're we're looking at comedy as being so important. That's mm. really what it's about. Mm. Is like we're realizing how valuable comedy and comedians are, which is why people get offended. Mm. People, you can't say anything, but no, you can if you have skill around it. But you have to understand, comedians have so much power because language has so much power and jokes stick in the mind and they kind of become these mantras of how we're gonna feel about society. And when you do jokes that essentially dehumanize people or certain groups of people, therein is the problem. Therein is the, the cut. Mm -hmm. Like we have marginalized communities that don't need to be cut down, they need to be brought up. These jokes will stick in the mind and then you know the comedians blame. But I think that also we have an acceptance around apology or we allow people to learn. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's just we're trying to understand that language is fair and you have to be more skillful when you're going to tell jokes. Gotcha, do you think that people are more now than ever, you've talked about white people accusing you of anti-Asian racism, which like hilarious, um, but do you think people now more than ever, you mentioned comedy being more important, people are taking a microphone to it because it has that greater importance. Do you think now people are focusing on how you say something and not listening to what you say? I think it's the, what it is is the intent behind it. So like if you have this intention to explain your own point of view, I think that's always gonna be noble. Mm. The thing about with comedy, you have to give it an unexpected twist. So comedy is really not 
necessarily what we think is funny, but what it is that we didn't know com it was coming. Mm -hmm. So that's the best way to sort of view comedy is the unexpected like experience. All right, Margaret, for course two, we have a sog paneer burrito. We have a little bit of turmeric rice in there, and then we have that delightfully velvety sog paneer, the big chunks of that firm Indian cheese, along with the stewed down spinach, a whole lot of ghee, and then spices like black mustard and fenugreek. We have also made two hot sauces. Oh God. We've, that was smooth. We've made two hot sauces. So these are both inspired by the chutneys that you typically get at an Indian restaurant. We have the sweet tamarind with habanero, and then we have a serrano with all that mint and cilantro. How beautiful. I love the baby butt, like I just wanna. Yeah, you can if you want to. You know, like I, a, like mm -hmm. a I'm a big fan kitten. of just hot saucing straight to the mouth. It's so good. It's numbing, but refreshing. Mm -hmm. I do love a really spicy thing, but you do, what's interesting if you like spicy, is that you lose your tolerance. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't go spicy for a long time, you lose your tolerance or the opposite, you can't eat it without spice. Mm -hmm. That's, I've, I've been there too. Respect, respect. Well, please dig into the sog paneer burrito and tell me, tell me about sog paneer burrito and where this came from. Well, this is to me really very, uh, it's kind of a new thing where they're having more Indian fusion or Indian mm. street food. So you're seeing all the things that you would get like in um, New Delhi, you would like walk down the street and you would you would just get like these things from the carts mm. or so much of Indian American food is really about the sit down and then you have the raita and samosas and everything, but we can like actually take it while we're walking. Mm -hmm. It's a walking food. It's a working, walking and daily food that we can have. It's not so much a special occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is a fabulous way to ingest it. I'm so excited. Burritos are my favorite food of all time. I love Indian food. Cheers. Oh. Ooh. Oh, it's hot. Oh, Ooh, good. so good. Mm. You know, uh -huh. It's so rich. Oh yeah, I love it. Oh, you're just gonna, oh. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Very nice. Mmm. Right the back of the throat. So bright. It's giving chimichurri, <laughs> but it's also like just so uh, bright and playful. These kinds of things, it's like you don't need a salad. You don't need the salad part, the lettuce part, because this is sort of like the greens. Yeah, the salad's been blended in there. Uh-huh. Talk to me about depression. Why is it so funny? Depression is funny because we've got to find a way, it's like perception of like, it's an odd perception of the world and not odd, but a negative perception of the world. Mm. So depression, oftentimes people are funny if they're depressed because laughter and humor is a coping mechanism. So it's mm. sort of like the hammer that breaks through all of that sort of um, dark glass that shrouds the de depressed. And when you can break that, you can all this light comes through and it becomes extra bright. Talking about laughter being the device that can sort of like shatter that dark glass of depression, do you think it's fair when people say that, you know, a lot of comedians are depressed? Um, I mean, I know Robin Williams was like an early like mentor to you yeah. or, or a, a hero of yours. You call him your comedy dad. Mm -hmm. um, or is there like, is that an unfair stereotype of comedians? Or do you think they really do go hand in hand? No, it's really true. Like the sad clown mm -hmm. is a real archetype in literature, in film, and in life. This is a real thing when you're sort of known for bringing joy and laughter to people, then people sort of like imagine that you might be happy, but it's all a facade. Stupid idiots. You don't know me. <laughs> The clown is often the saddest one. Mm. The ones who are clowns, we have to manage whatever that is that um, brings us so much sadness and so much pain. Mm. So I think that when you do that, when you make an effort to build out of that, you also inevitably become funnier, I think. So how do you, as a clown, how do you manage your, your own pain like that? Like, do you seek more joy or do you try and seek pain reduction? Or are they the same thing? Both. I mean, there's like, a, I have a heavy duty, so strong meditation practice, which oh. kind of goes like a lot. Like, and it, it has different forms, but I definitely seek that. Like I just, and it's not religious or it's, it's not based on any kind of like anything practice, but I just, just shut up for like an hour a day. So that helps. Um, also, I have a very active social life. I think um, being single helps. Like not having to negotiate my life choices with other people. So in my home, it's just me and my animals. I have to negotiate a lot with them. Mm -hmm. 
but they're emotional terrorists. They really are. They they are so they keep me going, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, like if I if I if I have like a like a great home situation, then the rest of my life is going to go well. And mm -hmm. so that's what I think does it for me is is really having that space. Beautiful. All right, Margaret, for our third course, we have dulcet bibimbap. We have the bulgogi on top with the raw egg yolk covered in sesame seeds. We have it served in the stone bowl, brushed with sesame oil. We got the white steamed rice. We have all of the panchan on top. We got the pickled radish. We have bean sprouts, zucchini, summer squash, sesame seed with spinach, carrot, and shiitake mushrooms. Beautiful. I love it. This is so gorgeous. You know what I'll do is I will uh, roast um, some corn in an elote style, mm -hmm. and then I'll snap that on top of it. Like whatever I, whenever I make like the big like sort of like big thing of corn. Yeah. yeah. Um, How often are you making big things of corn? Big things of corn only in the summer. That's right. I mean, please dig in. We got the. So you got to mix. Okay. I'm following your lead on this. You you know, like I always like wait a little bit because I want the rice to really crisp up. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so it, I like yeah. to wait and then you can put, um, get into it with some of this uh, beautiful sauce. Oh, please. Which I always loved. Just don't be shy about the sauce. Oh, just wow. Get in if there. you want to do me up, please. Like, I, yeah, just not don't to make be, you work on. Don't be shy as a about guest. it. Wow. Get in there. Do you fully mix? Yeah. Nice. You fully mix and be careful because the sides of this are really hot. But uh, the magic of it is this crispness, which gives it that kind of, it's like a tadig, like, yeah, a, yeah, like yeah. In a, a, a Persian rice dish. Yeah, yeah. Which I have one of those rice cookers that'll just make a special tadig, like the. Wait, they make rice cookers that make the tadig? Yeah, yeah. No way, I always thought the secret was using like the cheapest Walmart pot possible, because it's got, <laughs> like there's so many chemicals that the rice just will not stick to it, so you yeah. get that crust and you can. Which is great. Um, I'm okay. really stoked on this. Oh, and then we have a root beer float. I didn't even mention that, that's cool though. Oh, it's so good. Yeah? I'll say, I, I'm getting the crust on the rice. Hold on, I'm going in. Ooh. And the sauce mm -hmm. is really vinegary. Wow. It's really oh, good. This is really the hottest sweet. food we've ever had in the show. That's awesome. It's so hot, and you gotta be careful. Speaking of death, um, you were talking about Robin Williams. Um, I was curious about if you think people can like learn from others' deaths, or do you think that using their death as like a tool for I don't know, sort of uh, imparting wisdom upon yourself is kind of missing the point and you know, people just die. No, we can learn from everybody. Yeah. And in every manner of life that they lived, including their death, mm. including their misery and sadness, including their pain, probably especially their pain. Yeah. We learn a lot. And the more that we can learn from people who have passed, the better off our lives will be. Death is part of life. Yeah. Death is a really important part of life. Um, and often we, um, waylay our own happiness because we don't believe that death is real. So we'll like, okay, when I when I get that job, I'll be happy. When mm. I get that body, I'll be happy. When I get mm. that man, when I get that whatever, I'll yeah. be happy. When in truth, you may not get that until you're dead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, truly, <laughs> so, truly, truly. You just better be happy now. So the, the understanding that death is real will improve your life. And learning from people like Robin Williams will improve the way that you approach your life, I think. Yeah, did you, would you say you learned those lessons from Robin Williams, or this is like obviously a lot of long personal introspection? No, I think I learned, what I learned from Robin Williams is that I bomb really bad when I follow him. <laughs> so I learned Fair. how to be terrible at comedy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I learned, but it was a benefit, and uh, cause every time I would do shows when I was really young, he would come in and he would do a guest set and bump me, so I would always mm -hmm. go after him, and I would always bomb. And that was like such a great lesson of like, <laughs> yeah, comedy's not fun sometimes, but it's also always great. We're eating Korean food, you are openly Korean. Um, so yes, <laughs> I'm also Chinese too. Oh, you're also Chinese. I'm I'm so many Asian uh, things. This question was only about Korean stuff. It's okay. I'll still ask it. Um, can you talk to me about the idea of Han? Because that's something that I've heard a lot of Korean friends talk about. This like deep sense of you should probably explain it. Han is the painful part of happiness. Hmm. You know when you love something that you like makes you cry. Yeah. It's so beautiful you cry. Yeah, yeah. It's like the awful part of being happy. You know, it's understanding that happiness has dimension, joy has mm. dimension, just like everything else. And so it is the um, appreciation of the wholeness. I think where it comes in 
um, sort of relevance to Korea is the hardships of surviving the war mm -hmm. and rebuilding the country, the children who survive, the people that you lost, that you remember fondly. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of celebrations around people's deaths and we'll set a table with all their favorite foods. But it's, um, yeah, it's a complex emotion and every Korean probably will have a different interpretation of it, but it all kind of is that. Talk about people waylaying their own happiness because they don't think death is real. This is a really fascinating concept to me. People think that like, if X, then Y, if I get the house, then happiness, as opposed to just skipping the if then relationship and being happy. Why do you think people do that? It is trying not to be present in the moment mm. by trying to pre preserve that moment for the future. It's also oh. this false notion of control over our existence. Mm -hmm. We have no control over anything. So the only control that we do have is being here right now. When you can be here right now, you are in control of that. And that is the ultimate control. So that to me is really kind of my whole thing of like life. Like I gotta just enjoy what I have in front of me. You know, do what I wanna do because I don't know how much time I have. I don't know how much time is promised. This comes about like, I think because of people I've lost as well. Um, my very best friend died a few years ago and she was the girl that was like always prettier than me always smarter than me, always got the best everything, always funny, so funny, so amazing, um, just inventive. She invented actually simbl Simlish. What the when hell the are you Sims kidding? When the Sims talk, it's her. Holy sh Wait, her actual voice or she? Her, her voice. Get the hell out of when, here. Uh, that, so that's her, but she was like my very best friend since childhood. Yeah. So she passed away and now, you know, she, she was better than me in every way and now she's deader than me. So, you know got what? Her. It's like. <laughs> She was somebody I thought that I was gonna spend the rest of my life with. We was, had that mm -hmm. exit plan. You know, we were gonna be golden girls. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, you gotta live now. You don't know. The most vibrant of us, you think are gonna live forever and they don't. So we just have now. All right, Margaret, for dessert, we have a classic shortbread cookie. This is scratch made, creaming the sugar into the butter, really simple salt, vanilla extract, uh, and flour, and just classically baked. Beautiful. It looks so perfect, you know? It's just like these, the little fork things, like the, it, mm -hmm. it, it's just like, ugh, it looks so good. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I can already feel it. But it's just like the, um, mm. it's like a biscuit, but hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, I like these better than Madlands. Interesting. It's, you like the crumbly texture over that, the kind of chewy. Over the, the bouncy. Mm. I like the, crumbliness of it, the blandness, but it's also blandly rich. Yeah. Which I think, um, also it does not encourage overeating because you want to just savor that flatness of the flavor combined with the richness of the butter and the, you know, that it's a very elegant dessert. I really mm. love these. I gotta say one, I mean, I knew you were into food. I didn't know the depths to which you were into food. And I mean, one incredibly impressed not to be patronizing, but I love the way that you analyze food in terms of like your own experience, right? Mm -hmm. It's not what this should be. It's like, this is what I experienced and this is what why I like it. I yeah. think it speaks to the amount that you're present within yourself, which yeah. freaking rules. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. But I think it's like really like, the, these kinds of things are so important to notice mm -hmm. in life. Like, this is what makes life joyful. Yeah. Is noticing these small aspects of the brilliant, wonderful things that we could have daily that enrich us, yeah. like this rich buttery cookie. I love that idea of savoring something and really living in the moment. It really makes you see that time is really what you make it. Time is such mm -hmm. a construct of our imagination in our society. We can really expand time yeah. if we take the time to enjoy things like this. Do you believe in God? I believe in um, a semblance of a God that is not the God that would not like gay people. Yeah, that's that a, makes me real mad. That's a tough one for people to try and get others to believe. Like God's all loving, except except. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's weird. It's a weird concept. They kind of lost you from the jump. You know, because if you look at like the church's like iconography, it's like so weirdly like gay too. Yeah. Like it's very weird. It's like real leather gay. Uh -huh. It's like real like BDSM. A lot of BDSM gay, in there, yeah. Which is like hot and awesome. They didn't need to draw the abs that sexy and they did. Over, over all of that, I do believe that there is something out there. There's gotta be something. There can't be nothing. Yeah. How could there be nothing? Something out there, you know? But I don't I don't really care to find out except for the details, which is God is in the details. Interesting. 
So talking about death, what what happens after you die? Well, in Korea, they uh, say that you go, you die, and then you're presented with a bunch of choices of like, okay, do which what, what life you want to be in now. That seems a bit bureaucratic. Yeah, they're you know, they, and they're it's like, like they're going to the DMV. Yeah, they're like, do you want to be this? Do you want to be your mom's daughter again? Okay, <laughs> let's go. Like they basically give you like some choices of what mm -hmm. you want to do, and then then they erase your memory. Then you go out again. It seems like a pretty sweet deal. Uh, do, you, do you think that happens, or for you, it just you go night night and you're done? I think it's cute. Yeah. I think it's cute. I don't know. I also think uh, it's kind of nice not knowing because it's a fun surprise. It's like mm -hmm. a surprise party, and we'll just we'll just find out on the other side, which I think is cool too. Hopefully, you get to write that memoir first. I better. I already started it. So it's really, yeah, I'm excited about it. Nice, nice. <laughs> I, got, I just want to say one of the raddest things that you said was when you're walking down the street and you see like a little queer child, you feel the need to sort of like walk in a way that shows them that life is good. And you seem to have a really intense sense of duty in that way. Does that ever feel like a burden to you? Or are you somebody who wants to take up that mantle? Be like, yeah, damn right. I was the first person to put an Asian American family on a network sitcom. And you know what? That didn't work out. Yeah. But like, that was still me and that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. You have to stand tall in your life for the people that really kind of need to see it. Mm -hmm. And also it's like when you live a long time, you see how fair life really is. You think which so? Which is really interesting, yeah. The ugly become beautiful and the beautiful mm. become ugly. The people you think had everything actually have nothing. And it's so profound. The equalization of age, when we actually like are here to stay for it. And that's why like, I think presenting yourself really honestly is really important. Mm -hmm. But for young people, like, you know, they're so, uh, many problems and sad situations where you have where you know young queer people commit suicide mm. and i want to impress upon them you gotta live yeah. it's really good because you see all the people who bullied you they will get so unhappy damn you speak like a bog witch i love that <laughs> i you know, am like old so, become like, young oh, and it's, so, beauty. <laughs> it's so great no but it's really fun so then you see the people who bullied you who seem to have so much power mm. and then they grow old and then they're in the vip line at your shows for a meet and greet and you're like oh and yeah. then you have to be cordial and like great to see you <laughs> and you're just boiling with the joy of how fair life really is so you know, that's why I want to present to like kids, like I was a bully child, mm. bully queer child. The best thing is to get older. The best thing is to live. And not in the, uh, not only in the way that it gets better, you don't know how, how good it gets. You'll see. Damn, are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, other than me, who is the one person dead or alive you'd want to share your actual last meal with? Oh, I would have loved to eat with Anthony Bourdain. What a thoughtful man, what a, mm -hmm. what a beautiful man. Yeah. That was a death that really hit. Oh, the lightning round is not a lightning round, by the way. This is just me asking more questions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that was the death that hit me. The hardest no celebrity death ever even really affected me at all because to me, it's like, this is the life I'm chasing. This to me is the ultimate ideal of happiness. Me thinking if X, then Y, and then finding out that, you know, ultimately he wasn't happy and, you know, took his own life. That was like, ah, oh, crap. Maybe I should be happy with what I have. Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's hard because he was such a hero to so many, including myself. Who is your dream eulogizer at your funeral? My dream eulogizer, um, I think, uh, well, it would have been Joan Rivers because she rose to be so long for such a long time. You can bring her back for this. You she can would be, be great. Raise she her would, from the dead. I would, I would love for her to do it. I loved her so much. And um, her eulogizer was uh, Howard Stern. Oh, snap. At yeah, her a good funeral. One. So that was a really good one. I, I love him too. So it was like really like, uh, what a great person. He was crying. He was so, it was really a beautiful ceremony. Damn. But uh, that was a good one. So I think she would be great. Who plays you in the biopic about your life? Ken Jeong. Hell yeah. Oh my God, I <laughs> signed me up. I'm pre-ordering tickets immediately. Don't you think? Oh, 100%. He'd be so good. He'd, he'd kill he'd that role. perfect. Oh God, Ken, if, if you watch, Ken watches. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any regrets in life? I have no regrets, although I was in Rugrats. So no regrets, but Rugrats. You have Rugrats. I have Rugrats. You were in Rugrats? I was in Rugrats, I'm in the movie. Uh, are you happy? I'm very happy. I love that. That's true. simple, short, sweet. You're happy. Yep. 
How the hell do I get whatever you get? Anyways, uh, Margaret, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, I really you. appreciate it. Thank you for sharing this lovely meal with me. Thank you for being open and sharing your experiences. And if you can deliver your last words to that camera right there. My last words would be, thanks, I had a great time. So wait, was that to me or to like the world? <laughs> to my, those would be, those are like ideal last words. Like if I was to be executed before the hood goes on, that I would say, thanks, I had a good time before the hood went on. I love that. It's beautiful. Yeah. And thanks. I hope y'all had a good time. Margaret, tell the people where they can find you. Tell them what you got coming up next. They can find me on tour. I'm going on my big live and livid tour all over the place. Starts in Vancouver on February 18th. Find tickets on margaretshow.com. I've already bought 70. Ooh. I lied to them. I don't know why I do that. It's okay. Did you ever just lie for fun? Yeah. Your favorite food podcast has its own tea. Oh my God, we do? We sure do. Get your own A Hot Dog is a Sandwich logo tea at mythical.com.